Welcome to Comeback with Erica Cobb, where everyone's deserving of the comeback they're willing to earn. Today is a very special edition of this show with three testimony teachers who I hope you'll listen to their stories, learn from their experiences, and uh, take away that everyone has a story and they all matter. What do you do if your child gets caught in a cycle of self-destructive or even dangerous behavior? Some desperate parents are having their children abducted, taken against their will to a behavior modification program. Parents were promised a dream, an education and experience that would shape their troubled teen for a brighter future. Instead, it was a nightmare, a system that abused, isolated, and gave trauma to every child who attended. The Netflix documentary, The Program, unraveled the web of lies. They dehumanize the kids, that these kids are liars and manipulators. They use that to create compliance. It's hard to comply with something that you know is wrong. But honestly, it only scratched the surface. And today I am joined by more survivors who've made the ultimate comeback. Please welcome Corinne, Liz, and Rose. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Kevin. So I just want to kind of give context to how we ended up here today, because this is a little different than what I would normally do um, on a comeback. But at the root of it, it's the same, because we're talking about a setback season, and you are giving your testimony as teachers to our audience. So Corinne and I worked together for years. And I remember um, you telling me a story about this school that you went to and you told me, yeah, I I know it sounds weird. No one ever believes me. And I was like, what do you mean? I, I totally know what you're talking about. And I explained to you that in high school, I had a friend who came to my home in the middle of the night and he was bloodied and bruised and, um, he told me that his parents were having him kidnapped, which of course sounded crazy to me, but he told me that I would never see him again and he had escaped from this attempt. And I remember giving him like, I think $5 that I had and he disappeared into the night. And then about a month later, he ended up back in school and he said that they had called the whole thing off. And a few weeks later, he disappeared again and I was called into the office by the uh, police officer who worked at the school and told me that I would never see my friend again. And I didn't until I was about 21 years old when we found each other on Facebook. So I understood that this was a thing and um, I just really appreciate you getting everyone together to be transparent with your testimony. Thank you. It's a very common story. I know we have talked about that. I think a lot of people are seeing the program and this is the first time they're hearing about any of these things. So let's get into it. So you ladies all met while attending Cross Creek Academy, formerly Browning Academy, and it ran under the same WWASP umbrella as we saw in the documentary, the program. Mm -hmm. How were each of you transported there? Um, I'll start. I um, was at home. It was the middle of the night. Um, I was on my computer. Uh, I was talking to my husband now. At the time, he was just a friend. Um, and two people walked in my front door at about two o'clock. And the it was a male and a female. I later found out that they were husband and wife. And he was a retired police officer. Um, but he had a set of handcuffs in his hand. And he said, you can do this the hard way or the easy way. They closed the computer on top of my hands and I was out the door on my way to Utah. From? Colorado. Yeah. And my parents, um, they had kind of given them some insight in the fact that I was rebellious and that I might throw a fit. So I'm guessing that's why the handcuffs came out. But I I basically spent four hours on the way to Utah crying because I didn't know what we were doing or where I was going. And they didn't give us any idea. They didn't tell us what was going on. They just said, you behave and we'll be there soon. Were your parents present? Yes. As happened? Yeah. They were standing right there. And did they say anything to you? Um, my mom was in tears and I think my dad was holding on to her just because, you know, the experience itself probably wasn't the greatest for um, them. I mean, to make that decision, but um, I think they said, I love you. And I walked out. 
what are you thinking about? Like, how old were you at this point? 14. So what, what thoughts do you remember? Any thoughts that were kind of like rushing into your head? Um, well, I had been pre-warned by my cousin. Um, she gave me a call a couple days earlier and said, your parents aren't okay with how you're acting. Um, with everything going on recently, they've been talking about sending you away. And I told her she was lying. I didn't believe her, but it was sitting in the back of my head for the next few days. So when they showed up, I kind of already knew that's what was going to happen. Um, but when she mentioned boarding school, I figured like a school, a normal school. Um, so when we showed up there, it was a lot different. Corinne, do you want to tell your story? Um, yes. So I was sent to a hospital on a 72 hour hold because I had decided to run away, but like, not really just defiantly just want, I just, I needed some sort of control and I just wanted to be left alone a little bit. So I just like ran to my friend's house and they had the cops come get me, bring me to the hospital, local, the local hospital, put me on a 72 hour hold in the psych ward. And then the last day, you know, they have you do some work there, like, like meet with the therapist and things like that. Um, the last day I was under the impression I was going to go home. I had followed all the steps that they had me do. And instead they had me take some medicine. I remember the nurse coming up to me and she, she looked a little off and, um, she was like, you just need to take this medicine. It's to calm you down. And I was like, I'm totally calm. Like I don't need any medicine. And she's like, well, you have to take it. It's required in order for you to get out. And I said, okay. So I'm sure it was like Ambien or something, um, some sort of sedative. And it made me, obviously, I think the goal is to knock me out. And some two transporters, husband and wife, I don't know if it was the same one. I don't remember their story because I didn't care. We found out today ours was the same. Oh, wow. So probably was the same for me too. I don't know. Older couple, like middle age, yeah. older, um, handcuffed me and took me to their car um, from the hospital and put me in the back. And the wife sat with me in the back the husband drove. And I asked where I was going and what was going on. And they said, you're going to a school. Um, and I was like, where? And they said, they couldn't tell me. Yeah, they never told me that much even. Yeah, they couldn't tell me. So I just like, I remember being so drugged, but not giving in. I was, I was like, I'm gonna stay awake. And I'm just against the window spacing out, watching all of this, you know, surroundings, trying to memorize where I'm going, you know, because I feel like I'm being kidnapped. And I stayed awake the entire time, the whole drive to Leverick in Utah. Yep. And then they did my intake. It was the middle of the night when they did my intake. Miss Debbie did my intake and they strip searched me. They had sent me with to like a tub of stuff like pajamas, shampoo, conditioner, toothbrush, toothpaste, socks, underwear, that's it. And um, a note from my parents, I think, just saying, we're sorry that I came to this. And uh, they, yeah, strip search me, put me in my pajamas, put me in K Group's room, because they didn't know where to put me, because they didn't, it was the story of my life there. How old were you at this point? 16. And you had no communication with your parents when you were transported? No. So when was the last time that you saw your parents before you were taken there? Probably right before I, like, ran away. So at least, like, 72 hours or... Yeah. Yeah. Rose, do you want to share your story? Yeah. Um, I got um, awoken in the middle of the night. I think it was, like, 4 a.m. Um, by two people, the same people. Um, the covers were ripped off of me and the guy said, you're in our custody now, you need to come with us. Um, I was very tired, it was summer vacation. Um, and so I was like yelling and screaming and they pulled me out of bed, walked me upstairs and I saw my dad, but he didn't say anything. Um, 
and they threw me in the back of a car. Um, and I just was screaming. I was like, where, where am I going? Trying to yell at my dad. Um, and the guy um, sat in the back with me and um, he was like, we'll do this the easy way or the hard way. Um, and he rammed my head into the back of the seat um, and told me to be quiet and then drove me to Utah. I want to fight so many people hearing the story. Like, just the sense of three young women, and how old were you when? 16. Someone coming into, in, y'all, in both of your cases, your homes, which is your only sense of sanctuary. Comfort, yeah. And violating, you were taken out of bed by some random man. Mm-hmm. With handcuffs at 16 years old, like just the sense of like your security and safety. What did you, when you saw your dad, was that the first indication that you weren't being taken against, well, against your will, but that they were in on it, that it wasn't like a completely random thing? Yeah, I didn't really feel like I was being kidnapped because it definitely felt like you're in our custody. It felt very almost like government like. Yeah. Um, and then I saw my dad and he just, I didn't, there was just nothing. Um, and I think my mom wasn't present because she probably would have been crying. Um, and he closed the front door and that was it. And then I got a letter while I was in the car, maybe halfway there. Um, and it just was like, we had to do this. Um, I ripped it up and threw it out the window. Um, but I wasn't told where I was going. Um, I kept asking and they were just silent and I could just see them looking at me through the rear view mirror. So the three of you are all told in some degree that you're in custody, you're, you're coming with us. Mm -hmm. We're taking you to a school. So when you got there, when did you realize that this was something else? When did you realize that it wasn't like a school or something that was familiar to you at all? Pretty much. Probably when I had to squat and cough. Yeah. 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 That was the whole intake. Everybody had to get in the shower when you were being intaked and you had to get completely naked in front of a staff member, bend over and cough. Like you brought something into the airport you weren't supposed to. It's the only other time I had heard about that in my life until that point. It was very much like prison for adults, yes. like style as far as intake goes and dress code, it or was, we call it dress code. We but. It was shocking. Like just walking in, there were people standing there watching us. They thought it was kind of funny. Yeah, they were amused. That, for it, sure. that we were like literally spiraling and had no idea what was going on. And they they laughed. It's really They sick. made jokes. It's really fucked up. Even the new girl or the girls that were there do your intake. And even they kind of laugh at you too, because yeah. they're like, already brainwashed at that point. And so they're like, oh, don't worry. Like you'll, <laughs> this is just kind of. Okay. Right. So other girls in the program. Mm-hmm. Yes, saying. come and tell you kind of what um, you're up for. Unless you're there, unless your intake's in the middle of the night, like mine, because mm-hmm. you know, then everybody's got to be in bed. So I didn't get, I didn't even know that there were other options. Like you could do an intake during the day. Mm-hmm. In the documentary, um, they talk about there being men present sometimes. Did you experience any of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's men staff members. And while you're being strip searched. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but the only doctor they had to do anything um, for women on a yearly basis was a male. Mm -hmm. And he was creepy. Yeah. And he he would ask you if if your boyfriend left you any presents. Yeah. Yeah. You could tell Just almost weird all of us that we had HPV yeah. and then everybody got out and got actual like testing done and didn't. none of, n- none of us did. <laughs> so it was like their way of scaring us into celibacy. Mm. I'm it's getting Larry Nasser vibes from the doctor conversation. I'm getting, um, cultivating a egregious system for pedophiles, mm-hmm. um, and having children preyed upon in a place that they have zero autonomy. So on top of sending you to this 
institution, it seems like a hotbed for sexual predators. Mm -hmm. And there's no, yeah. like, the staff that work there have no reason to be around children. Like, they're not educated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I think not even that. It's like, they don't have... Yeah, no qualifications, but like you wouldn't want some of these people around. Probably no background checks. Yeah. Yeah. And we learned about that during the documentary. Um, survivors say that they experienced a array, an array of horrors while attending these academies. With the show of hands, if you don't mind telling me if you've experienced this, um, awful living conditions. <laughs> um, weren't allowed to make friends weren't allowed outside or to even look out a window. Kept by run plans? Yeah, yep. Or Sorry. writing down songs, you couldn't, it was all yeah. run plans. Run mm -hmm. plans. You were planning on running away if you didn't eat without. If you looked out the window. So it's a cat five. It's, you were planning. You'll drop away. all your levels if you look out the window. There was nothing to look at. You were in the middle of Utah, so it's not like it was a good idea anyway, but if you're you looking got into a courtyard. That, right. <laughs> Well, and what we saw, um, just to put context for people, and I would suggest you watch um, at least the documentary, the program, there's other documentaries out there. Um, this kind of spurred this conversation, but you're isolated. It's not as though you can just run across the street. It's right. like you're in the middle of nowhere. So escaping is even dangerous on some level. Well, and they told us that everyone around would bring us back yeah which i think is true i think so too everybody in that town and most of utah you can go pretty much anywhere in utah and say hey have you heard of a program for youth like troubled youth do you have you ever worked at one or anybody in your family i guarantee you at least one of their family members has been yeah known. well it's the same with the prison system like what you're doing is you're taking a town that doesn't have the financial resources and you're giving them options for jobs and to stimulate their economy with prisoners and in this case they're children um let me go back to some other questions were you allowed to talk or weren't allowed to talk no so show of hands no one was allowed to talk um did you spend time in isolation rooms um, witnessed abuse, either physical, emotional, or sexual. My whole buddy got body slammed. Yeah. Many times. two giant men. Yeah. Suffered abuse, either physically, emotionally, or sexually. Yeah. Is there, I mean, you talked about um, getting body slammed. What are... If there's one thing that sticks out to you the most about this experience, what would that be for each of you? Unfortunately, I had a different experience than a lot of kids. I decided very quickly that I wasn't going to fight. So I wasn't one of the ones that was getting tackled or um, restrained or, um, but there were different ways that they went about attacking those kids. So we got put on silence or separated from our group or removed from levels or um, but I did have quite a few experiences with people around me that were just, I mean, like she said, getting tackled or held down. Um, they were sat on. They were hit when they weren't listening. Um, and I kind of feel bad because at the time I didn't believe those stories. They were so bad that I only slightly believed them. And now that all this is coming to light, we do. But you feel bad because you technically were one of the people calling them liars yeah it's like um they would kind of pin us against that was part of the psychology behind it and like have us snitch on each other yeah. and keep each other but it's keeping each other accountable for our programs yeah know. um but i think the the thing that i witnessed was my hope body uh, hope buddy lauren so when you when a new person comes into the group they're assigned with a high level I was only a high level for a very short amount of time. <laughs> I spent the rest of the time on low levels. But um, I was excited because I finally got, I got her on my birthday, August 5th. Um, Lauren, and she thought she was like a hardcore gangbanger. And anyway, I had drawn a picture of her to send to my parents. Because I was drawing pictures of everybody in my group. 
so that they could see my group. And then I was doing kind of like a personality analysis of them on the back of the picture and what I, just the description. So they knew who I was around and like kind of an intro to mm. my friends or people I'm around. Anyway, and my picture of her was not flattering. And I, my therapist, my parents sent the whole packet of pictures back to my therapist who then brought them out in group to show everyone and what my description of them was on the back. And she was a hothead, definitely a little BPD situation going on or bi bipolar a little was and is, and which is fine, open about it. Um, and she took her bull water bottle and chucked it at my head and flipped a whole table over. And the, what do you, what did we call the guys? This, the guys that would sit on the Sam to everybody. Yeah. But did they, the, all the radios? Yeah. Anyway, just these two giant men. They literally they only line. came in to sit on people. Yeah. Like we didn't see them at all during the day unless they were coming into rooster and something. So they would hire these Samoan men to do this specific job. Big. And they were like O linemen. Okay. And they came and rushed in and took her down. And when she got out of isolation, then they took her to isolation and apparently sat on her the whole time. Okay. Uh, she came back to group and her whole chin was bruised. Like it was like almost a beard. Like it was awful. And she, uh, like her arm was all bruised. Um, I know it was hard for her to breathe for a while. So she probably had a broken rib. Um, but it was like so obvious because her whole face was just completely. Yeah. They didn't hide it very well. Yeah. And people got in trouble and they were sat on. You weren't supposed to come back to group and tell everybody about that, but they did. I mean, because they had to tell somebody. Yeah. Um, but th they weren't really, it wasn't stuff we talked about a lot. So. Well, also seeing something like that, it's like a, it's a dog whistle. It's a warning to the rest of you mm -hmm. to yeah. fall in line. Which is why I decided to just mind my own and put my head down. And she had the hardest therapist. So when you went into work, she'd see lose your shoelaces, your hair ties pencils, erasers, anything that you can do any sort of damage with. Yeah. You have to point to your head to ask to scratch, ask to scratch, scratch. or touch yourself. Food, water, bathroom, meds, emergency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the only things you were allowed to talk about. And if it was outside of that, they would write you up. Here. Rose, do you want to share? Um, so many stories. Um, I got put into worksheets pretty early on um, for having a friend and um, for having a friend, mm -hmm. a girl that I felt like I could talk to. Um, and so I got in trouble for being codependent and um, I got thrown in worksheets for two weeks and um, I, you have to sit in like this little wooden chair looking down because you're scared to look at anything because anything to look at is, uh, you know, you'll get in trouble. Off task. Yes. Um, and so your mind kind of goes crazy because you like forget how to talk. Um, and so I felt like I was going crazy. And then, you know, this, there was a girl like on the desert process, which means she doesn't exist. Um, she was watching her water like drip into the carpet um, for like five hours. Um, and then I think when you, your showering process when you're in worksheets is very like concentration campy. Um, and it's like in this really dingy old, almost like gymnasium, I guess, bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's like stalls and so you can't really see the girl next to you. Um, but like staff members come and dress code you. The dress code is really um, violating and humiliating. Um, and you have five minutes to put your shampoo and conditioner on a little ledge, um, undress, uh, 
shower, get undressed, or get back dressed, and then dress code again. Um, so there's really not a whole lot of washing going on. <laughs> um, but I think that was, being in trouble was not fun for me. And so after that, I was like, okay, I'm really gonna pretend to think this is okay. You know, I, I, when we started this conversation, I said that it was, it's something I haven't forgotten, the conversation that we had years ago. And you were like, when you said, no one believes this, and you said it so casually. And I was like, no, 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 I, I, I know this is true. And I just remember that, like, thinking in the back of my mind, like, what must that be like to have these realities, these experiences that you've all had and they're traumatic and have little to no one who believes that this happened? Like, even when I was telling this story about the documentary and bringing it back to, and I, I said it to my mom because I remember my parents telling me that I must have gotten the story wrong about my friend who was taken away in the middle of the night. And it's somewhere in my head, I started to believe that I got that story wrong. And it wasn't because my parents had ill intentions. It was just, that was completely unbelievable to them. So when you're recounting these stories, is there a part of your brain that like, tricks you into like how are you like how are you recon recognizing that this happened to you but also protecting yourself in your brain does that make sense like are you gaslighting yourselves at any point or you're just like this is my oh, truth yeah. regardless mm -hmm. of it feels very real still mm -hmm. like i remember more than a lot of people and i can smell the smells, I can see all of it. Yeah. It's like it happened yesterday and oh. there's no question. I don't, I don't remember a lot of it. So watching the series was just, it, it reminded me a lot. <laughs> a lot of it, I think my brain just shut out. It's like, no, you can't do this anymore or else it's going to mess you up. And that's, I mean, you come back out and you can't tell your story. You tell that story and it just, it sounds weird, <laughs> you know, like, what you did on a daily basis, like, it's just, like you said, it's unbelievable to an extent. So I think most of us got to the point where we didn't say anything. I never told my parents. They had no idea what I went through until this came out. So like Wait, this month. You never, never. It shared any of the experiences. I did, but I got a lot of what you were saying. Um, my, my dad was very fooled with the whole situation. I mean, and my mom was just wanting to bring me home. So there was both sides of that. So he had to stay strong. Um, but the seminars were a lot different for parents and he felt he learned quite a bit. And ours were just, I mean, it made it to the point where you don't want to read anything self-help or, you know, it all becomes just kind of like a throbbing pain in your head. And by seminars for the parents, uh, for people who don't know, your parents were invited to these seminars. Mm -hmm where they were essentially gaslit about the entire situation and was it like helping them become better? What was so, the major? So there were like mirrored seminars. So we would go through orientation, discovery, focus, keys, and principles. principles so. And then they would also go through orientation, discovery, keys, and principles, or just discovery. They did yeah. discovery, they didn't they do did orientation. orientation. And they're told that we are going through the same seminar. So we're learning the same things, getting the same tools and having the same experience at the same time. It's not the same experience. And it is not the same because we can choose out and they can't. Yeah. And like, the, they say choose out, that makes it sound like we decided to leave. That's not how it worked. Because we're Somewhere, to not work Yeah, the seminar. The on day out. one and two, it was three days long. And on day one and two, they would go around and clean house essentially. If you weren't doing what they expected you to do, they would send you out. And you had to wait another two or three months before the program, you know, scheduled more seminars. So that but added it, a lot of time. To but it also program. like just kind of like solidified the fact that we were messed up because they're thinking we're going through the same thing and we are choosing to not do the seminar. Mm -hmm. So we're still messed up. 
Yeah. And we're still not listening and we're still not working. They made it sound like a refusal to our parents. Right. Mm -hmm. And And really what it is, is like, we can't cry. Yeah. Yeah. I chose that orientation because I couldn't cry because I was like, realistically, I just needed control. I just wanted a feeling of control. I was getting it from all angles. My mom's super religious. I wasn't the perfect Christian kid. My dad is super about academics. I was, I had gotten a couple of B's and a C, like they were worried about that, but I was okay. I just wanted some control. So what do I have to cry about? I can work through these, mm-hmm. tr- these issues that are in my head. And so I chose out and added another two months to my stay. She chose out of focus. Four times. Four times. That's so that's the, the one that people will recognize on this is the towel hitting. Yeah. From the program. Mm-hmm. Which is discovery. So, I thought it was focus. No, focus is we push the wall. Oh, it was? Focus is the die process. Okay, yep. The lifeboat. Okay, so. And then the pushing of the wall. Yeah. But it, like, to The pushing of the wall. We had to push a wall, like, we had to imagine all of our problems were, like, in a boulder, and we had to, like, push it off the cliff. But you're pushing a wall, so nothing's happening. Um, And so we pushed a wall and beat the floor for maybe two hours. Um, After being smart food and water deprived. Right, Mm -hmm. and then then other girls that are on high levels or staff members would come and whisper into your ear. um, You need to Like I got a lot of like slut shaming stuff and so they would use like your past against you. So they would come in and be like, um, oh, you liked it when all those guys did that or they would, um, they'd be like, this is why your parents don't love you. And so you would beat the floor because harder. they know these things that your parents have told them, mm-hmm. and you're forced about. to share. Mm-hmm. Also, you're forced to share, and then so there was a lot of like fake crying, and then eventually you are crying. Um, yeah, and I think the die process was at least the hardest for me. You actually had to tell people that to they die. weren't allowed on your lifeboat, so they like, I mean in theory, drowned. Mm -hmm. You had to look people in the eye. And those people left the seminar. They could no longer be a part of it. So like they they put us all against each other. I mean, even if you had friendships there, you had to ruin them to get further. And we don't forget those things. Yeah. I've actually reached out to multiple people just to apologize. I apologize to the one of the girls when I finally staffed Discovery. It's really awful. So I think to cry, but she had had an abortion before she got there and I had to scream at her when she was hitting the floor with the towel that she killed her baby and that she made the choice to get pregnant and be a slut and and get and kill her her baby and I I apologize to her but it still runs me (laughs) in our terminology so if they sexual abuse or anything was like that they would just pull you out we you were a victim because you were talking about it you had to reenact it which you know like for me I'd never nobody knew until I went there and we had to write a confession letter at the very beginning that said everything that happened to us prior that might have led up to us being there and your first draft never went through it always got thrown back at you and you needed to write more and so people came up like they said on the documentary with anything they could I was reading mine with my husband a couple days ago, and there's a couple stories in there I, I am not certain happened. Because you had to, basically, they were looking for you to doctor your story, to make it more sensational, mm-hmm. to justify you being there, and ultimately to justify your parents paying. Right. Because that is what it was all, I mean, this is all about money at your expense um, and at your trauma what really sticks out to me the most is like just hearing your stories and how emotional you are about what you were forced to do and your levels of empathy for a system that never even considered you as human beings. Like it's re-victimizing victims for capital gain. Yep. It's I don't think they ever expected us to grow up. <laughs> no. 
or talk about it. They expected us to be adults. Facebook happened. That was the crazy part. Yeah, thank God. MySpace was the only thing happening then. So they didn't figure, that's why we weren't allowed to trade numbers, addresses. They did not expect that when we came out, we'd be able to get back in contact with these other people. What was crazy is we know everything about each other, even people in other groups. You clearly remember names and titles of adults who worked in the program. Have you ever looked to see where they are now, what they're doing, tried to make communication? There's some staff I actually like. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I will say that. Mm -hmm. And I think that they knew what was going on was fucked up. And and some of them wanted to provide a little comfort, like Mm -hmm. Miss Laura C. I don't know if you guys ever had her on your group. Yeah. But she was a little bit bigger, blonde. She had a NASCAR cup. Oh, yep. Okay. She ate a lot of corn nuts. <laughs> <laughs> they always had good snacks they always and had drinks. Snacks that we would just awful. smell that we couldn't eat. And yeah, couldn't they, eat it. Like, put they on would literally let us smell it. Eat. Like, yeah. some of them were nice enough that they're like, come on, come smell it. You know? Yeah. They would, they would Wait, let us smell it. Wait, I'm sorry. It sounds <laughs> like some of them were nice enough. Bizarre. I thought you were going to say to sneak you. <laughs> no, 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 no. They would let us smell it. But... And then we would put it on our lists for like in our journals, like, well, I'm going to go home. I'm going to get ranch corn nuts. Mm-hmm. Disappointing mm-hmm. for the record. <laughs> <laughs> so disappointing. they smell better. Than Not what I wanted. They, they smell so good. Like, but we would do things like that. But Miss Laura C was so compassionate. She would sew our things for us. Like she would listen and she, she was warm. Yeah. Miss Tamania. I don't know how she got that job or kept it. <laughs> yeah. She, Bull- she was crazy. She bullied them into letting her keep that job, but we're friends with most of us are friends with Miss Tanya on Facebook still. Miss mm-hmm. um, Mona was awesome. Miss Mona. Miss Mona, Mona, hello. hello. Miss Mona, hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She used to sing to us. Yeah. Um, but she was tough. Yeah. She it's, was. One that's hard for me is that, um, I mean, they explained the family reps in this whole situation. Apparently, they ended up with a bit of a spiff if we stayed every yeah. month. Um, but my family rep was a great person and really kept me sane while I was there. So like a second mom. So I reached out to her and thanked her. But there's a very small list of those people. I reached out to my family rep, Miss Bottner. Mm-hmm. Oh, Bobby's Everybody awesome. liked Miss Bobby. Mm-hmm. She didn't like me. Oh, no. So uh, she told me I was not worth remembering. But I had Miss Jean and she was, she's gone through a lot in her life, yes. especially more recently. So I'm cautious about, I don't, she doesn't deserve to relive this. I don't think based on what she's experienced more recently, you could read. but I went to Utah. And when I was working on the show and I met up with Miss Jean. Oh, you did? I did. And I recorded everything. And I do think that she lacks accountability. Mm-hmm. And. Well, they all do. I, I know she loves kids, but I know she's manipulative. And I know that because everyone in my group, I think, stayed the longest. And you're obviously E group and F group. We were in sister groups, um, Rose and I. Um, she got all those extra little stipends for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, extra stipends? Like when you keep work. us here longer. If, like if the parents are thinking of pulling their kid and you let them know like, well, and she was so good at it. She'd be like, you know, they're really happy. They're doing really good. But you know... I don't know if they're going to make it through discovery. I've got a few like reservations, you know, because there was a little attitude last week and it's like, where, where was the attitude? You know what I mean? Like and by stipends, she was getting compensated. It, for yeah. Like your parents. So. Yeah. What do you call that when you get like, I think got bonus commission. Yeah. Yeah. Bonuses. Bonuses. Yeah. Um, we didn't know that until this came out. Yeah. So that I, was surprising. But I had the handbooks too. Miss Bobby told me that. That really? they get paid more the longer we stay. It's wow. crazy. But it, it, she definitely has a manipulative sales personality. Yeah. I but think was, that was... Ki- but was easy yeah. and kind. For the most you part. were 
You were there the longest. You were there for 22 months? 23 months and five days. It was 22 by the day. 22 months and how long were you? 16. I turned 18. Okay. And stayed. Yeah. And my program probably would have been 10 or 11 months if I didn't choose out of seminars full times. I had to wait another three months every time, so it turned into another year. Well, it's a never, it, there's, it's a no-win situation. They because... would have dropped you, I'm sure, and then, yep. yeah. I find it particularly interesting, like, when people have to deny or refute someone's personal experience or stories, I think there's something deeply ingrained in them that it might mean something about them yeah. if this is true. But you guys are all, you know, being very transparent with it. And sometimes it's met with scrutiny of what did they do to get there. And to me, I'm like, we have people who are locked up right now who have murdered people mm -hmm. and are getting better treatment than what you're describing. So what could a child actually do that would warrant any of these things. I know you're a parent, Corinne. Do either of you have children? I do, yeah. I have two boys. And what do you, when you are looking at your children, what do you think? Like, have you had that reconciliation between your experience and being a mother now? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, obviously, because of learning all this, I definitely would have other choices to make. I, I don't think that I could ever put my kids in a situation like this after being through it myself. I'd honestly rather put them in a room with me for a couple of years, you know? I just, you, you lost the feeling that people cared where you were or how you were feeling, and I would never do that to my kids. Um, I think if something good came out of this, it would be that we do have more accountability, even if it was forced. And so our communication with our children would be completely different than the communication that we received or experienced growing up. So I would openly talk about taboo topics with my kids and have. Mm -hmm. I'm very open with them. I, I do have to circle back because I asked you all how long you were there, but I have to touch on you, Rose, because you stayed past your 18th birthday mm -hmm. um, for a few months. Why did you make that decision or how was that decision made? Um, I think it's a slow, it's a slow manipulation thing. Because um, when I got there, I was like, I'm leaving at 18, you know, I'm going to wake up that day and I'm going to be out. Um, and so before my 18th birthday, I was given, um, paperwork sent by my parents in my therapist's office. Um, and I got my exit plan, which is what I will receive if I do decide to leave. Um, at that time I was already on phase four. So I was getting up there. Um, and I got, uh, my parents were going to give me $50, a bus ticket to Salt Lake City, and they would allow me to call them on Sunday evenings, collect. Um, that was your exit strategy or? or that was that what was they were going to give provisions. me. Provisions, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I had to sign it. And um, I actually had to ask our program director to stay um, because I deserved this. Um, and then I turned 18. I wasn't allowed to talk about my 18th birthday. Um, and then I turned 18 in August. And then October, um, Ron dropped me from level five to one. And I was like, I need to go. <laughs> um, so I was held for a week because they said that they lost my ID. Um, so I was held in isolation. I wasn't allowed to talk. And then I got brought into my um, group therapy and was allowed to speak. And every single person in my group got to tell me how horrible and manipulated I was or manipulative I was. Um, and that I probably didn't deserve to be there. 
and that my parents shouldn't waste any more money on me. And then I got brought up back to isolation and finally, after a week, I got put on a bus to Salt Lake City in the middle of the night. I know it probably sounds strange to people to hear that you were 18, you were an adult, you were able to leave and you didn't. Mm -hmm. But when you think about the fear of the unknown versus it's like the devil that you know versus the devil that you don't, you've been institutionalized for quite some time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think about the anxiety that people get from like normal pedestrian situations, but you're kind of being thrust out there in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, without like, I wasn't going to be able to go back home. I wasn't be able to go see my parents again. I mean, that was like really ingrained in me that I was going to be just homeless, like on the street. Um, so the fact that I even took that eventually is actually more crazy to me yeah. because today I would be, I mean, you're a baby at 18 and I was still like mentally probably 16. Yeah. Um, so to just be like let out on the street without anything is very scary. So the fact that I did that is still actually surprising. Yeah. Liz, you're the only one here who graduated the program. So what was that experience like and what were your thoughts when you when you achieved that? Yeah. Um I was so ready to go home by that point. It was just I remember preparing and I remember it took me months to write my life contract, which is the basically the same rules there, but they translate to home. So you write down all the rules that you're not going to do, the things you're not going to do. Your life contract mm -hmm. with yourself. Yep. And, your parents. and technically your parents are supposed to honor that. When you get home, you're supposed to be doing daily meetings and check-ins and you even write yourself up like you did in the program if you make mistakes. Um, however, Luckily, my parents, once I got home, kind of just let the whole thing go. So I didn't have to do my life contract. Um, and it, in fact, looks pretty untouched. I put it together in a binder and sheets and everything and never wrote a single thing on it. Just moved on. But that's not how I thought it would be. I mean, it was it was very structured. We moved on to, you know, um, basically trying to go back to high school and regain our credits and I think that was the craziest part. I'm sure both of them can speak to this as well, but um, they gave us credits for things that were not real credits. Right. So I got a basketball credit. I got a note-taking credit. Yeah, so these, I mean, it's it's not real. And you get back and I ended up in the counselor's office immediately. They were like, okay, we need to, we can work with this. We need to change this, this, this. Right, because it's, your credits have to transfer. It needs to be accredited school. I mean, so, you were the only one who actually graduated the program, but all of you received a diploma. Was it, what was recognized? Was anything recognized as an accredited? Mine was. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I had, I had credits there, but I transferred back in junior year of high school and finished there luckily. So that's kind of what saved, I think, my diploma. I've, I've heard good stories. I mean, both of them have good stories on graduating there. They, they left with a real diploma and were able to move on with their lives, at least from I mean, you went to college and got... Yeah, so, I mean, I already have my bachelor's, so they can't take it away from me now. <laughs> <laughs> no no take right. no I... My mama said, you know, my mother's a college professor. She's like, there's one thing they can't take away from you is your education, so okay. go ahead. All right, cool. So I don't know if I got a real high school diploma, if it, were, if it was accredited or not. It was on a flimsy little printout. They, like, when I walked out of the building, I was like, do I get my diploma? Because I graduated, I finished my junior and senior year in six months. Like, as soon as I got there, I was like, all right, I'm finishing all my schooling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if I finish all my schooling, they'll let me out. One and big they upside, it. they required you have a B or above. Yeah. So our grade averages were, I mean, really for high. me, mm -hmm. the best I had in high school. When I got back, it just dropped again. So. But you didn't learn anything. No. No, no. it wasn't real learning. You were, um, like, in fact, when you got to a higher level, you were able to get on computers and answer your questions there, but it was multiple choice. And if you got it wrong, you could retry until you got it right. Yeah. So it was just, I mean, you didn't even have to read it. You yeah. just clicked until you were done. 
Watching this documentary, the program, and you've all watched it, um, you know, having experienced what you experienced, what were you, what were your thoughts while watching this? Oh, it was anxiety. Wild. Like watching yourself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was just word for word. And it kind of feels like, I mean, this, I've said this a couple times, but it kind of feels like you were imprisoned mm-hmm. for a period and you were guilty. And then years later, like 10, 15 years later, people find out that what you were saying actually might be true. Mm-hmm. Feel have a little vindicated. Yeah, I was going to, vindication, have you gotten people who have come back around like, I, I didn't believe you, but now I do type thing? My parents. Yeah, my, I had told them a little bit about it, but I had gotten so many, oh, that can't, you know, that's not it. Mm-hmm. That we just never got down to the nitty gritty. So when this aired... It took me, my dad loved the seminars. So he quoted them and everything since. Uh, it's kind of always been a part of my life. But after I watched these episodes, I could not swallow it anymore. So I think he said one thing and I'm like, okay, we need to watch this. And um, within 45 minutes of the first episode, they both came up to me in tears and apologized. So parents didn't know either. I guess that's a good point to make. Um, they led them down certain hallways. They let them see certain things, certain people. They would set us up with the high levels they knew would not act up while the parents were there. And you would walk around the gym or there were different areas they would set you up, but it was it was all a show, yeah. especially to our parents. I think watching it, I was resentful because I was like, it took for this to be on Netflix Mm -hmm. for anyone to to believe us. Well, you know, and we didn't even get the worst of it. No, there are many more stories to tell, which is, I mean, like above me, when I came into the program, the girl that taught me in, um, spent a long time in programs. She was in and out since she was nine years old. Since she was nine, all the way until 18. So, um, there's part of her story that she's telling on her own, but I don't think she's ready for this stuff. And there's there's a big group of those people that just, that's why we're here. We got to let people have their opinions or at least feel comfortable enough so that they can tell everybody what happened. Yeah. Rose, where were you when you found out about this documentary and did you watch it alone or with other people? Um, so I knew it was coming out before it came out. Um, so I, I mentally prepared. Um, and I got all my like really close people, um, and said, I can't watch this alone. And so we got in my house and we all watched it together. Um, and we got through the whole thing that night with a few stops of hyperventilating, crying. Um, me days. Yeah, me too. I could not. Like I mean, I feel that, but I, yeah, I didn't want to watch any of it alone. Yeah. Um, and then my best friend, um, slept over that night because I was like, I can't be by myself. Yeah. Um, so I was prepared. I was prepared. I don't know that I was, even though I tried to prepare myself. I mean... I, I had no idea it was coming out. It was big news to me when the kids were starting to talk about it a couple of days beforehand. I had no clue. Yeah. You know? So I kind of had to just get it over with, peel the Band-Aid, so to speak. Um, but yeah. We found out from the, pro- from the group? Yeah, from our survivor group. Do I you remember how I found out? <laughs> and you have these survivor groups that are like on like social media. So you're yep. yeah, yeah supporting and, and sharing stories and all of that with each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, has Do you feel that there are people to this day who should be held accountable? Oh, yeah. For, and how does it feel knowing that no one has been held accountable for anything? Not great. But there's there's a good amount of people there that um, I would say at least the very first few tiers that need to pay for what they did to people. And when you say pay, like what? Somehow they need, that's the hard part. Like to define this now, I don't really know because it's so far past it. But 
I don't care that their name is in the middle of this yeah. or that they're going to get some repercussions from this because they should. It took a long time to even be heard. So, I mean, I guess they've got their side of things, but in your mind, what would those charges be like or trafficking? Mm -hmm. Child abuse, endangerment, neglect, neglect, mm -hmm. manipulation. Is that is that, is that a charge? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's in the court of public opinion. Yeah. Yes, abuse of power um, oh, to yeah. minors. Like I mean, it's that, sick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ron so, Garrett. Yeah, oh, Ron Garrett needs to go, needs to go down. Like, yeah. but the and thing is, was thinking he's the director of our program. So he was that the was. manager of all of our therapists, our family reps. He was like the head honcho. So when he rolled in, people were swooning over him, or you know, scared, disappeared. <laughs> Ron Garrick's last words to me were, um, go die in the streets as a whore, get out of my program. Yeah. He's awful. It's, that was with your $50 and a bus ticket in the middle of the night mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere. Because mm -hmm. he dropped me from phase five to one and he like slammed his hand on the desk and looked right at me. I think that one of the thoughts that I had while watching the documentary and hearing all of you speak is how easily adults are manipulated by power or the perception of power and money, um, how easily adults are manipulated by the idea of belonging and being included. We see it all the time on social media now, but this was like in real time. And in real life. And I just, it's to me, it's just alarming because so many people gain so much power and prestige by the perception that they're greater than something that they are. And that's a reflection on us as a society. Like, my biggest, like, sometimes my mother will call me and be like, I think you should maybe like calm down a little on your. You know, like you're going in really hard. I don't want anything to happen to you. And people have threatened me a lot. You know, I've had cops at my house a lot because someone has threatened to do something to me. But I can't live with like just allowing people to pull the wool over people's heads and not speak out about it or say something about it. And it's because of things like this. It's like, that's just some dude who ended up in some position, maybe he has money or wealth or prestige or whatever, but a lot of people have money and wealth and they don't abuse their power and put people in situations where they're literally being traumatized in their most formative years. Like it's just, I have interviewed hundreds of people over the past 20 plus years and I can't remember like I'm like I, I keep thinking like proclaim because I'm like having this feeling like I'm really almost out of body about this because it's just like I am trying so hard to become a mother myself and I am going through IVF like doing all of these things to try to have a child and I have done all of these different things. I'm sorry, I don't want to make this about myself, but like, you know, I'm a CASA, like I'm, you know, I'm doing things for child advocacy and it just really breaks my heart in a different type of way to know that like, I'm really sorry, but like, the way that you were like, just sent away, you know, like the way that like, you were made to feel like you didn't matter in a time when like we should be affirming in your lives, you know? And I just, it just really makes me feel like, um, I'm sorry, I never ever do this. I don't know if it's like the, I'm really sorry. I really never do this. I'm really sorry. Um, like I, When I first heard your story, when I watched the program, when I thought about um, how like 
I recreated a story in my head about what happened to my friend to make me feel better. And that happened, and I kept that story for years. And it was really erasing someone's experience and to see this play out on television this way and so many people coming forward. I remember when Paris Hilton first came forward and you said, finally, somebody might actually believe me. And, um, and I just thought that's really unfortunate for a lot of people because this story needs to be believed because if history isn't told, then we have a tendency to repeat it. And I just really wanna thank you guys for being so transparent with your testimony because I do think that someone is going to hear this and realize that um, we need some serious changes in this country. We need to protect our kids, all children, because also this was a place of privilege, if you will, because your parents paid a lot, a lot of money. How much do you think, do you know how much your parents paid? Six to, grand a month. Yeah. Six grand Roughly a month. there, yeah. And then it's a few thousand to get escorted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my college fund was gone. And my dad said he took out loans he's still paying for. My but parents used my college for as well. All gone. They would put people on payment plans um, if they couldn't afford it. Like if they were lower income, they would have payment plans and contracts. And they would be paying, like, we've had a lot of friends die uh, in the last however many years. Um, overdose or commit suicide and their parents are still obligated to continue paying for the program and I mean into their like elder like they're elderly and their retirements are gone and they're scraping by and they still have to because they're contracted for these so you could be of any like I don't know socioeconomic status or you know anything and go there. They would look through your finances prior because that was mentioned on the program, but everybody's monthly fee was a little different. I think about what you just said, I just wanna to touch on really quick because when you're talking about being a parent and wanting to be a parent and not being able to wrap your mind around how something like this can happen, it's something that I've talked about a lot because it, I think if we didn't have abandonment issues before, we definitely have them now because the people that are supposed to love you unconditionally are saying they can't handle you. Mm -hmm. And there are They've essentially given up. And there are conditions. And that is your view of love and unconditional love in quotes going forward for the rest of your life. And I can't imagine, I can't, Imagine sending my kid away and giving up on them. I can't imagine. I will, I will take my accountability with me. Yeah. I will. I would bend over backwards to make sure my child knows that I had a part in why they experienced trauma or whatever. But I, at the same time, understand why a lot of parents are in denial. Because as a parent myself, it would be so hard mm -hmm to swallow the fact that you paid for this. You paid for their trauma. You subjected them to these things and this pain. And before we wrap, I want to give you each the floor if there's something that you really wanted to um, share or um, a warning or something to the audience about your experience. I'll start with you, Rose. Um. I think the most thing I want to say, obviously I get really upset at the people that own these places and they're, you know, they work there. Um, but I can almost get over that in a way. Um, I think so like trauma from this was all in the hands of my parents. That's where I like really have, a, have an issue um, that I probably won't be able to get over. Um, I haven't spoken to my parents in six years. Um, they don't want to take any accountability and want to just move on and be happy. Um, and so sometimes I feel like I like never came home. What would you want from them? 
Um, I mean, just to say, like, we're sorry what we did. Um, I think my mom said once, she said, you didn't get sent away for what you were doing, got sent away for who you are. Sorry. Um, and I was a really cool kid. Yeah, I feel like part of me is still kind of sitting in there. And I don't think anything they could say could really change it now. But... So you don't find hope for reconciliation with your parents? I think it's been too long. Oh. And I hope they watch it. Um, I hope they let it sit with them, you know, because they didn't really want to hear about it. Uh, but yeah, I, I work really hard to like be the person I was before I left. And um, it's not easy. But you're here and you're sharing for everyone who isn't here mm -hmm. so I think honoring that really cool kid who she was reconnecting with her and it's from my understanding you look exactly the same so you're you know <laughs> holding on to you <laughs> <laughs> it's the no kid thing <laughs> what about you Liz um I, you know, I went through the situation with my parents and I, I think I've received the apologies I need. Um, I think there's still some pain there that will take some time to work through. Um, but to have a basic understanding and people know what you're talking about is really very nice. And I didn't, I didn't bring this up earlier, but um, when I came back from boarding school, um, I went back to an old friend of mine who then became my husband. He was my best friend before I left. And um, once I got back, I found out that his brother knew someone that was in a program for almost all of high school. And she's a big fighter for these things now. She's currently working in the Supreme Court to close these places down, the ones that are still open. Um, so she, she has a group called Unsilenced. And um, it's just, I think that's awesome. So it was kind of cool to... First of all, that was the one experience I had where I could tell somebody and they understood because they went to something like it. So um, to be understood there. And then um, I came back to also find out that my husband um, at the time had my hope buddy, the girl I trained into the program living in her basement. So um, that was shocking yeah. to say the least. We didn't know each other prior. Um, I knew she was from Highlands Ranch and um, I went from Castle Rock. So. Um, I knew there was a chance that we could meet up later, but to walk back to say hi to my husband and uh, or my friend at the time um, and see her standing there, that was totally bizarre. Totally bizarre. I guess I would want parents to know that they um, have other choices and to keep looking because that's not it. Right. It's not the fix all you want. No, I think I, I just agreed, guys. Um, I agree with them and uh, there are other options and to take accountability for your part in your child acting out or misbehaving or whatever you're interpreting it as and take, just to take accountability for it and time mm -hmm. and don't be too busy to, you can always make money. You can get a new job, whatever you got to do to really spend some quality time giving their trauma power and showing them that you actually care and it could solve so many things but so many people don't want to take the time they want the control they want to utilize their time elsewhere and they want to chuck it up to a loss and have someone else deal with it and that's taking the easy way out 
And I don't agree with that. So I think it's uh, to look at yourself when you feel like you're a parent who's dealing with this. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing, Corinne. Thank you, thank you for having us. I just, I, I thank you for trusting me with your truth um, and being able to amplify your stories in a way that will empower others, hopefully um, other survivors to one, feel validated, maybe vindicated. Um, and even if people don't share the experiences that you're sharing, there's a little bit of all of us in your stories. There are times when our experiences aren't believed. Um, there are times when we've gone through traumas that we still have to figure out how to reconcile in our lives. And I think through your testimony teaching, um, through your generous gift of testimony teaching, um, people will find their truths as well and be able to talk about it. So I appreciate you all. I appreciate your stories and your time. And to my comeback community, um, we'll share resources in the show notes um, for organizations like Unsilenced, as well as some work that's being um, taken in real time in order to get these institutions shut down. So thank you for spending a little bit of time with us on Comeback with Erica Cobb. You can always go to my online home, comeback.tv, for more information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.